discussion today is how to talk to someone who believes something weird. But I have a colon in there, it's not in the title of the workshop itself, understanding and responding to new religious movements. And that's what we're gonna be dealing with. Uh, I'd like to, if we could, begin with a Bible reading at Matthew chapter seven. And when I'm talking to you this afternoon about new religious movements, I'm talking about groups that claim to be true Christianity, but they are not. And in a more popular lingo and uh, nomenclature, we can talk about them as false prophetic movements, false Christian movements. They carry all the baggage. They look very Christian to the unobservant eye, but, and even to some of the observant ones, but they are not Christian. And we're gonna talk about them, how we can identify them, and then how we can respond to them. Uh, reading from Matthew chapter seven, verse four to 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree, can, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, into the fire. so you'll recognize them by their fruit. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing on this time together. Thank you for all those who are here with us in the room, all those who will watch and listen online at some point. Make this relevant to each of us and may the Holy Spirit give me and give all of us direction and understanding and knowing how to reach people who are caught up into these, into these aberrant heterodox movements, we pray in Jesus' strong and saving name. Amen. Well, aberrant Christian, true, but really false in essence, movements, religious movements have been with us from the beginning of time. And where did they begin? How about Garden of Eden? Because the, the chief and the father of all of them came to Adam and Eve, and what did he say? Did God tell you that? Did God really tell you that? Now, he didn't say God didn't tell them that. He just raised the question. Did God really say that to you? Why, well, God knows that in the day you eat that tree, your eyes will be open. You'll have a knowledge of good and evil. All true. William Perkins, famous uh, Puritan theologian, said, don't believe the devil even when he tells you the truth. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They believed him, and he used the truth to weasel them and uh, move them into a position that ended up obviously hurting everyone. Uh, so they've been with us from the very beginning, and we see that evidence in the Old Testament. It seems like every time there was a good prophet who came along, there was what? False. A false prophet. Oh, did the Lord say that? Did he really say that? Peace, 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 they're crying. When the Lord's talking about judgment and talking about their sins, well, you know, those aren't too bad. So we find that throughout the Old Testament, it's replete in the history and in the recordings of the prophets themselves. And then the New Testament, ta-da, and there's Jesus preaching and teaching, and every once in a while there was somebody else that wanted to mimic or to uh, uh, counterfeit what he was doing, and they would come along, and then so forth and so on. The book of Acts has several key incidences of people trying to mimic and portray a false gospel or portray a false gospel when obviously uh, the apostles were attempting to evangelize people, even to try to counterfeit miracles or even demon possession exorcisms that didn't work very well. As you know, when it wasn't done in true biblical fashion and in the true name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have the rest of the New Testament. And in some ways, we can be very thankful for false uh, prophetic movements because of why. Many of the epistles were written to counter them. The heresies emerged within a few years, almost immediately after the uh, 
ascension of Jesus, along come the heretics seeking to deceive, to abuse, to uh, misdirect the truth. And we find that in the records of the epistles. So you have Colossians very clearly directing issues related to false prophetic movements and heresies. You've got Galatians. You've got large parts of First and Second Corinthians. You've got parts of the letters, the pastoral letters of Paul. Uh, Jude, the example probably number one, the whole letter is addressed to the matter of those that attempted to pervert the faith. First, second, John, etc., and so forth. And then we come to the book of Revelation. And the first letter in the book of uh, Revelation to the seven churches, chapter 2, verse 1, was to which church? You remember? Ephesus. Ephesus. And uh, we find there the words, and these things says, He holds the seven stars in his right hand and who moves among the seven golden lampstands. You know, we have immediately a vision there of Jesus' omnipotence. He holds the seven stars in his right hand. We have an immediate position and understanding of his omnipresence. He's moving among the seven golden lampstands, the seven churches, and of his omniscience. Because he says to them, I know your works and your labor, and your patience, your endurance, and that you have tested those who are apostles and have found they ha are not. So he compliments the church at Ephesus for doing what? Testing the false prophets who came in among them and who said, oh, well, we're followers of, of the true Jesus, just like you are. Uh, you know, we, we believe the gospel just like you do. However, we've got some new things to tell you about it, obviously, that they wanted to add to that gospel, et cetera, and so forth. So the point being, Jesus compliments the church there at Ephesus. So we must not be intimidated by people who say, well, let's, not, let's just be kind to people, i.e., let's not oppose them or let's not speak to their errors. That's how most people treat kindness. But let's remind ourselves what 1 Corinthians 13 tells us when it describes love. Love rejoices in the truth. Remember? It rejoices in the truth. And the Lord disciplines those who he loves. So that means when we find error, it's appropriate for us to address it in a way that honors him, but nonetheless speaks directly to it, corrects it, and provides some clear direction for it. And of course, we can move into early church history. And immediately we find within a matter of decades, there are other gospels being written down, the apocryphal gospels. Dr. Craig Evans, friend of mine, New Testament scholar, was asked a question once, why don't you include the apocryphal gospels in the canon? He said, have you ever read them? If you read them, you'll discover why we don't include them, <laughs> because they are truly apocryphal and made up gospels and contain loads and loads of heresy. And of course, the early church fathers, the, the leading theologians of the early church were what? Apologists against the heretics. The, the great seminal work of the early church was attempting to correct uh, error that had crept into the church and needed to be addressed, et cetera, and so forth. And we're not talking about secondary or tertiary issues. We're not talking just about the form or manner of the of the baptism or the, how you practice the Lord's Supper, we're talking about seminal, important, this, the, uh, decisive elements within the faith that needed to be addressed. But the good news is, folks, we've come to the modern era and all that's passed away. Uh, not exactly. Not exactly. I commend to you a book I read 25 years ago, Harold Brown, Harold O.J. Brown, entitled Heresies. Uh, portrayal of the, the uh, full title was The Heresies of Betrayal of Christ and the Errors of, of History or something of that sort. And he goes through and he documents all of the errors, the heretical movements that emerge within the life of the church. It's a great read. 
and we'll come back to the important point on that in just a few moments. The bad news is for us, maybe the, in some ways the good news in another, is that it's going to get worse and not better. It's going to get worse and not better. How do we know that? Because the Bible says so. Just go back and read Mark 13, read Matthew 24, and one of the signs of the end, well, there's only really one positive sign of the end, which is what? the dissemination of the gospel uh, around the world, that many people will uh, come to faith, that all peoples will hear, all people groups, all ethnic will hear. That's, that's the one positive sign. But the other element is that there will be many false gospels, false messiahs, false Christs. And they will be empowered by the kingdom of darkness Matthew 13, uh, excuse me, Mark 13, Matthew 24 tell us even to do wonders, miracles. So we need to be on our guard and that's why the truth is so important and why this kind of a topic is very vital to the life and health of the church and the life and health of all Christians and people everywhere. Okay, that's, that's where we are at this point in time. Uh, but let's go on to another issue, and that is why, from a human perspective, do these groups emerge? What's the reason? Well, I think we can come to some reasons about that. One is rationalism versus supernaturalism, or what I would prefer to call supra-rationalism. Because we have a supernatural and a supra-rational faith. Not everything that we know in the, or not all that we know about Jesus and the gospel and the truths of the Christian faith can be rationally dissected, understood, and fit into our puny little cubbyhole box minds. There are a lot of mysteries in the faith, a lot of glorious things about the faith. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Um, and you'll discover that false prophetic movements make the error of trying to fit everything into a very rationalistic position and point of view. If they can't understand it, they'll rationalize it, and they'll use scripture to justify one way or another as they, test, as they twist scripture to fit their understanding. So what are some of those doctrines that we might think are super rational? The Trinity, uh, what a glorious doctrine that Trinity is. The Bible, or people have told me, and we've discussed it about the Trinity, that the Trinity is the greatest teamwork in all of history, in all of supra-history, <laughs> that we have the evidence there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, working together perfectly as one God, one being, three persons. And it's not just a philosophical concept, is it? It comes right out of the pages of Scripture. People, and we'll, we'll get to this in a little more detail in a few moments, but uh, the disciples were strict monotheists. And their creed, if you, if you had one, could be summarized in the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Uh, and yet they had an experience of three years with Jesus that changed their perspective on that. Trinity is super rational. We can't in the end fully explain it. We can use analogies, we can use explanations, but you could fill room after room this size with books of people who've investigated, articulated the doctrine of the Trinity and we've not, we've not got to the point of exhausting it. And in that light, another doctrine would be the deity humanity of Christ. What an amazing truth that that little baby in that manger in Bethlehem was fully man, but fully God, the Lord of creation. And fullness and in its essence was contained in the person of that little baby in that manger. And yet God was in heaven as well, God the Father and all of his glory and God the Holy Spirit. Well, how do, you, 
how do you rationalize that? You can't, you just, in the end, try to explain it, you understand it as far as human thinking allows us to, you glory in it, you praise God for it, and you worship the one who is our Lord and Lord of all. The atonement. How do you explain that on the hours that Jesus was hanging on that cross, it was possible that all the sins in the mind of God and in his righteous judgment were put upon Jesus. He who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How'd that happen? How'd that happen? Well, we don't know fully. We can't come up with a the chemistry, if you will, the atonement to say, well, this is how it happened. We have to glory and revel in it and to realize when John the Baptist said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that's exactly what he meant. Have you ever thought about it that Israel had a lot of, of uh, sacrifices for individual sin and for sins of the nation, but they never had a sacrifice for the sins of the world until Jesus came along. And John the Baptist said, that's the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. That was a matter of divine uh, revelation to him. Rationalism versus super rational. Well, the false prophetic movements, the cultic movements, if you will, want to rationalize. It's all a matter of, man, we, we're going to figure this out. And if we can't, we're going to make it work. <laughs> we're going to come up with a formula that fits our understanding and that we can live with. We can't live with that kind of mystery in our theology or in our uh, doctrine. Another cause for uh, why these sorts of things happen is date setting, date setting. 1840s, early 1840s, 1842, 1843, a man came along by the name of William Miller. And what was he doing? He was setting dates for the second coming of Jesus. Not a very good thing to do. Uh, because you can be sure of this. Somebody sets the date, you can be sure of one thing, that's not the date. So you can take it to the bank. They set the date, that's not the date when Jesus is coming back because Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour. And in his human uh, journey upon the earth, even he uh, didn't know the date and the hour, part of the emptying of himself. But William Miller comes along and says, oh, I know the date when Jesus is coming. So all you folks go out and sell everything you have. We'll go over here on the mountaintop and, and welcome him back. Didn't happen, did it? But to, and by the way, have you ever wondered why they go and sell all that they have? Why, why would you do that? I'd go and buy. I'd take all the credit I could out and I'd, I would get the nicest car I could find and drive it around until that date. I, would, I wouldn't worry about carrying any more debt. I would try to just... to catch and drive that too expensive car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you could be of some use, you know, in that regard. So uh, anyway, date setting is a big issue and what happened with William Miller's movement? Well, it gave birth to Adventism. Seventh-day Baptist groups, in Georgia and the United States, where I come from, you can still see signs, Seventh-day Baptist. Well, that came out of the Adventism movement, started by William Miller, as did Seventh-day Adventism, as did much of Jehovah's Witness theology. Came out of the Adventism movement. And there's great danger in it. About 2011, I guess, May, Harold Camping came up with another date. And on that very date, I was president of Midwestern Seminary. We were having graduation. And I told all the graduates, folks, your work has not been in vain. Jesus is not coming back today. You're going to get your degree, and you're going to go out and do ministry. Because Jesus said that... In the day you think not, then he's going to come back. An hour you're not considering, that's when he's going to return. So if you're thinking about it and everybody's alarmed about it, he's not coming. And date setting, though, can be a big issue. But there's a third reason, 
And all this is on my outline. You can all have a copy of it. Spiritual counterfeiting. Spiritual counterfeiting. Uh, Satan knew he couldn't stop Jesus from coming as the God-man. He knew he couldn't stop him from going to the cross, dying for our sins. Maybe he didn't understand all the implications of it. He, he entered Judas. I don't know what he thought Judas was going to accomplish by the betrayal of Jesus. They actually fell into God's hands, and God used it for good, Romans 8, 28, to accomplish the greatest victory over sin, the only victory over sin that man has ever known on the atoning death, and then the resurrection of Jesus. He couldn't stop that. He can't stop God's work in the world in terms of uh, the message of the gospel getting out to all the earth. He's not going to stop the second coming. He's not going to stop the millennium, however form of it, whatever form of it you believe in. He's not going to stop that either. He's not going to stop any of that. But what he can do is counterfeit it. Counterfeit it. Now, um, people say to me, doesn't it discourage you that you have all these different religious groups that claim to be true Christianity? To no. It's encouragement. Why? You don't counterfeit, folks, what is not of value. You only counterfeit what has real value. Do I have a hearty amen on that one? Okay, let me just give you an example. I have in my possession here the highest denomination of banknote ever issued in the history of mankind. It is a $100 trillion banknote issued by the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. It's, it's worth absolutely nothing. I did pay $2 for it in a souvenir shop in Harare, so I guess it's worth at least $2. I was speaking in a meeting in Botswana and I gave this illustration and a pastor from uh, Zimbabwe came up to me and he gave me a couple of $1 billion notes. And this is before I realized they were worth nothing. I said, can I pay you something for them? No, no, no. He said, I have a box full of, at, of, I have a box full of them at home and I use them to start fires with. <laughs> Now this is this is an actual bank note. It's not a, it's not a gimmick or a or a uh, counterfeit of any shape or form. But let me ask you this question: If you were going into the counterfeit business, would you counterfeit Zimbabwe dollars? I don't think so. What would you want to counterfeit? Euros, dollars, U.S. dollar, Swiss franc. If but they're very hard to counterfeit. They're the most difficult currency in the world to counterfeit so many colors and the, the, the Swiss put great care into making sure their Swiss francs are not counterfeitable. You wouldn't, you wouldn't counterfeit something that's worthless. It doesn't make any point. You counterfeit what's valuable, what has real importance. Because by counterfeiting it, you can devalue the real thing and you can make product off of your false productions. What Satan is doing with false prophetic movements. He's simply counterfeiting the real thing to make product off of uh, falsehood and so forth and to divert people from the real faith. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about counterfeiting, we're not talking about differences again in baptism or church government or or uh, things of that nature. We're talking, or understanding the Lord's Supper, whatever it might be. We're talking about the essence of the faith, the main core doctrines of faith, the person of God, the person of Jesus, the doctrine of salvation, and so forth. That's what we're thinking about and talking about. We'll get to that right now, and that will be our next topic. That's why I want us to read together Matthew 7. 15 through 20, because Jesus makes a point here. The point is, don't judge just by appearances. What, what's his point about how you can tell what a real tree is? What, what, what kind of a real tree? By the fruit. What's the fruit of that tree? That's how you tell the difference. Now, I'm a city boy. But I can tell an apple tree. 
in the fall when it bears apples. I can tell a peach tree. Georgia is a peach state in the United States. I can tell a peach. I can tell a plum. I can tell an orange tree, a lemon tree by the fruit of it. You don't just judge by appearances. And this is what Jesus is saying about the uh, thorn bush and the, and the fig tree and so forth, our grapes, the grapevines. You, you tell them by the real fruit of what they are in their essence and what they bear fruit as and what they produce in reality. False prophetic movements will always portray themselves as true Christianity. They will have Christian names like Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now they are cutting out Latter-day Saints and they want to just call, be called the Church of Jesus Christ. Of course, they put Latter-day Saints on all their church buildings, so that's a little tough thing for them to do. And their website was mormon.org, but they don't like that Mormon Latter-day Saint stuff anymore. They want to make it even more attractive, more deceptive. We'll get rid of that stuff because we want to give the real appearance of being absolutely 100% totally Christian and straightforwardly biblical. Their names and the witnesses of Jehovah, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Wow, that's impressive. Kingdom Halls. Wow, that's amazing too. Well, they don't want anything to do with the term church, but they will use a term that is biblical in orientation, orientation so they call themselves Kingdom Halls. Or Christian Science. Now that's taking... You know, the world of science blending with Christianity. And if that didn't appeal to people, I don't know what would. would. You can be a Christian, you can be a scientist in, in both cases. In actual fact, you can't be either one. But that's how they project and portray themselves, even in their the way they name themselves. But they do other things. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons baptized by immersion. Now, that's enough to fool a lot of Baptists I know. Oh, they baptized by immersion. They must be really biblical then. That's, that's what they do. Then, then, yeah, we're with them. All right. That's a good biblical. They baptize by immersion. They proselytize. They're out there doing missions. Correct? Question. How many of you have ever had a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness knock on your door, come to your house, or how many of you have ever seen them out on the streets and towns and places of your country where you live proselytizing? 100%? Okay, now question for you. How many of you have ever had an evangelical come to your house to give you a track, a gospel portion, a gospel of John, maybe a short witness? See him out on the street sharing the good news, talking to people. How many of you have ever seen that or had that happen to you? Okay, so we've gone from 100% to about 20%. And what's that tell us about the fact that these false prophetic movements don't have the gospel? They don't have anything compared in any way, shape, or form to the gospel, but they do have a commitment. And that commitment is to share with every person in your country. I don't care which country you live in. They have a worldwide plan. But you can't judge them by that. Did you know that Jehovah's Witness, to be a good publishing Jehovah's Witness, you have to give two hours a week to proselytization. You can take a couple weeks off, maybe for vacation here, there, and yonder, but you basically aren't in good standing with their movement unless you're given at least two hours a week holding a sign up, holding a, an awake magazine, going door to door, passing out tracts. Now, the, what are there six or seven million Jehovah's Witnesses in the world? That means in a week, in a week. Let's, let's dumb it down. Let's take it down. Let's just say they reach 10 million people. Or they spend 10 million hours a week. Wow. Five weeks. 50 million, 10 weeks, or 50 weeks, 50, wait a minute, I don't know, my math's got me all messed up now. 
But in a matter of about three or four years, they will have spend enough hours proselytizing to spend an hour with every person on planet Earth. And yet, as evangelicals, we far outnumber them. Mormons, proselytization, mission work, mission work. There are, what, six, seven million Mormons, Latter-day Saints in America? But they have 50 to 60,000, 70,000 full-time missionaries out in the world today. Now, they were set back a little bit with COVID because they do a lot of door-to-door stuff. But they've got 50 to 60 to 70,000 full-time missionaries spending five days a week of their time out knocking on doors somewhere in the world, proselytizing, using the, uh, promoting the gospel of Joseph Smith. You know how they do that? Because they create a missionary culture. I talk to Mormons extensively about this. When a baby turns, when a little child turns five or six years of age, parents take them down and open a bank account. Not to buy a car, not to pay for the college education, but to send them on their Mormon mission. Brigham Young is a very large private university. Private universities in America can be very expensive, 10, 20, 30,000 bucks and up for tuition a year, but it has the lowest tuition rate of any major private university in America. Why? Because when those kids come back off their mission, they want to be able to say, you come here to school. You can get a very good rate on what is a standing scholarship offer if you'll go on that Mormon mission. Those parents pay for that child to go on that mission. They basically support them with food costs. Church gives them a place to live. And then the church will fly them home when they spend two, after they fin- finish their two-year mission, or they'll travel home from the United States. And that's how. The, now I'm a Southern Baptist. We brag about having 4,000 full-time missionaries. Very unimpressive. Now we have a lot more volunteers, short-term volunteers. That's true, and students that go out, short-term volunteers. But that's not very appealing information or encouraging information for a group that's approximately twice the size of the Mormon church. So we can't, we can't judge them by their appearances. They use, more, they use biblical terminology. They use biblical practices like baptism by a merchant, Jehovah's Witness and Mormons especially. They proselytize, they do missionary work. People are impressed with that. They quote the Bible and they use the whole issue of biblical reasoning out of context to to proselytize people. People say, oh, those Jehovah's Witnesses, they really know their scripture. No, they don't. What they know is a method to confuse people who know a little bit of scripture but they give the appearance of having great biblical knowledge and you talk to somebody, what's your impression about Jehovah's Witnesses that came to your house? Oh, they really know their Bible. No, they don't. They know how to use text out of context and jump around proof texting to confuse you. If you ever say to a Jehovah's Witness, look, those verses you just quoted, let's look them up and let's read what goes in front, four or five verses, what goes behind. Let's establish the context for what you just quoted to me. They'll crash and burn every time. But the appearance is these people really know their Bible. Therefore, let's get to the heart of how we identify them. And let's use mathematics as our standard for identifying false prophetic movements because mathematics, I'm appreciative to Watchman Fellowship and Alan Gomes and others who've created this method, but I use it regularly. Let's use mathematics as the basis for understanding how to identify false prophetic movements. Mathematics is comprised of four basic operating principles. The first thing you learn when you go to first grade at school, the first operating principle of mathematics, besides counting, is what? What is the first thing you learn to do in in arithmetic class in school? Addition. Addition. So one plus one is two. Two plus two is 
Four plus four is geniuses here. We got a bunch of geniuses. Addition, addition. Every false prophetic movement practices addition. What kind of addition? Addition to scripture, to the Bible. Now, no false prophetic movement will say, we don't like the Bible. No, 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 no. We're against the Bible. Every one of them talks, they plead with you. We love the Bible. We embrace the Bible. We believe the Bible is inerrant. And a Mormon will tell you that. A Jehovah's Witness will tell you that. Basically, any of the new religious movements will confirm the inerrancy of Scripture. That's what they say they believe, and that's what, in some sense, they do believe. But none of them believe the Bible in the sense of sola scriptura, the Bible alone. All of them add to Scripture. In what way? Well, with the Mormons, it's other books. If you go into a Mormon bookstore and you said, don't say, give me a copy of the Bible. Say, give me a copy of the scriptures. They'll go over the wall, pull down a big, thick Bible, book, I should say. The reason it looks like a study Bible on steroids, it's so big. The reason it's so big, there are four books in there. There are four books. First one's the Bible, then the Book of Mormon, then Doctrine and Covenants, and then Pearl of Great Price. All four of those books they consider to be divine revelation and inerrant. All of them are perfect revelations from God. If there's any book in that four that they have a problem with, it's the Bible. Because the Book of Mormon says there's plain and precious parts missing out of the Bible. Joseph Smith rewrote and corrected, he said, whole parts of the Bible. Uh, you won't get it in the uh, Salt Lake City Church of, of Jesus Christ edition, but you can get it from the reorganized Community of Christ edition, the Joseph Smith version. There's several hundred verses in all of Scripture that he went back and corrected or added to, including Genesis 50 which is a story about the death of Joseph in Egypt, the very last verses, because he'll add, he added there a story about another Joseph who would come and who would reveal the fullness of the gospel and be the true prophet to his people and so forth. I wonder who he's talking about. Well, he's talking about himself. And we can get on to the Jehovah's Witnesses for adding in the beginning was the word, and the word was a God. But Joseph Smith totally rewrote John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the gospel. The gospel was with the God, with God and with the Son. I mean, he totally corrupted verse 1 of John's gospel, chapter 1. Point being, uh, the only book in those four that they have a problem with is the Bible. And he said, that's why we have the Book of Mormon, that's why we have Doctrine and Covenants, because that corrects and adds to the fullness of the revelation that's either missing or incomplete in the Bible itself. And just to make matters worse, what they say too is that the Mormon president or prophet can receive direct revelation from God that can be canonized as true scripture. Just add it to the confusion and add to the dynamic uh, element of, of Mormon understanding of their own canon. And then we have our friends of Jehovah's Witness. They don't have other books, but they add a totally new translation, what they call the New World Translation, which, by the way, is not a translation. It's a corruption. And, of course, Charles Taze Russell said, Jehovah is God's personal name. That is God's name. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So what they went back in their version of the uh, New World Translation is about 4,500 plus or thereabouts editions of the word Jehovah in the New World Translation, as well as depersonalizing the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is referred to in the Greek text, it's always he, but the Jehovah's Witness always make it it. 
And they don't say God's spirit moved across the, across the face of the earth. They say God's mighty force moved across the face of the earth. Colossians 1, Jesus made all things. No, 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 according to Jehovah's Witness version of the Bible, Jesus made all other things. Why? Because they want you to think that Jesus was made himself by God, that he was created by God, Heavenly Father. Aberrant translations, authoritative interpreted sources or authorities. So you can go to Christian Science Reading Room. What do you see always out in front of a Christian Science Reading Room or church? Yeah, you see a beautiful shop, uh, a beautiful display case, glass window, open Bible. Boy, that's impressive. An open Bible. They want us reading the Bible, right? Yeah. What's always next to it? Key to Science and Health, Mary Baker Eddy. Bible will have some verses underlined and highlighted. You go over and look at the Mary Baker Eddy volume, the interpretive tool for understanding the authoritative interpretation of that Bible passage is there in her uh, her book, her volume. So you have to read both together because you can't understand the Bible unless you're reading Mary Baker Eddy's authoritative interpretive tool for understanding the Bible. <laughs> Always addition. But in addition to addition, once you learn addition, what do you then learn in, in first grade? What's the next step in the arithmetic? Subtraction, subtraction. So two from four is, think about it, two. Uh, three from six is three. Five from 10 is five. We know how this all goes. No false prophetic movement. Every, let's put it this way, every false prophetic movement subtracts from the key essential doctrines of Jesus Christ and the nature of God. None of them accept the nature of Jesus from a biblical perspective and a doctrinally orthodox Christian perspective as fully God, fully man. None of them accept the nature of God as triune, eternal God. They all interpret it differently. And it's interesting, isn't it? That Jesus next to the Bible is probably the most counterfeited, well, he is the most counterfeited person in history. Every religious movement virtually has their interpretation, their view of Jesus. And we could talk out the, outside the lines of, of uh, false Christian movements. We could talk about world religions. What about Islam? Who do they understand Jesus is? He's a prophet only. He's not, he was born of a virgin according to the Quran, but he's not God in the flesh. He didn't die on the cross. He wasn't raised from the dead. But they want to talk about Jesus. I remember uh, being on an airplane, a guy came down the aisle. I knew he was a Muslim by the way he was dressed, nice suit, shirt, no tie beard, no mustache, coloration of, of probably uh, an Arabian man he, or an Arab man. He comes over and sits down next to me, start a conversation with him. I said, where are you from? He said, Saudi Arabia. I said, oh, really? That's interesting. I said, where in Saudi, Saudi Arabia? He said, Mecca. Oh, Mecca, really? You know, I think you're the first person I've ever met from Mecca. Uh, was born and raised there. He said, yeah, my father was professor of Quranic interpretation at the University of Mecca. So I started talking and said, well, tell me what you think about Jesus. What do you believe about Jesus? He said, oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. He was a great man, a man of God. And I said, well, tell me more. Do you believe he was a prophet? Yeah, he was a great prophet. The greatest prophet? No, he was the second greatest to Muhammad. Okay, now the truth is starting to come out, but you say you had to dig a little bit. But even Islam has their version of Jesus, as do the Eastern religions. He's an avatar. He was a guru. He was one who was enlightened. 
but the false prophetic movements, they do the same thing. Now they'll use, here's the thing that we need to understand about false prophetic movements. They use our vocabulary, but not our dictionary. They use our vocabulary, but not our... So they'll say, yeah, Jesus was the son of God. But how do Mormons interpret that? They interpret that, that Jesus is not eternal. He was not coexistence with God, Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit. But he was literally born of God when he in the spirit realm cohabited with Mary. She got pregnant and Jesus was born. And then he was born when he came to earth, when God cohabited with Mary, also one of his spirit children, and was born a man in this realm. You can pick up Bruce McConkie's uh, biblical exposition of the New Testament, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And McConkie says in that volume that God sired Jesus just like any man sires his children. So they like to talk about Jesus. They talk about Jesus as the Savior. Jesus is the big, their big brother. What do they mean by that? They mean by that we were spirit children too up in the pre-mortal realm. Jesus was the elder brother because he was the firstborn of all creation. Co-opting Colossians 1 to justify that. Therefore, Jesus is of the same species as we are. He's just a little more advanced than we are. He got ahead of the game a little bit. And he was born of a virgin, uh, i.e. Uh, a woman that God, Father, had sex with. By the way, you'll notice too that Mormons never say God, the Heavenly Father. They always say God, Heavenly Father. Talk to them sometime and talk about God and ask them about their beliefs about God and they'll say that. Why? Because they believe that there are a multitude of gods out there. There's an infinite number of gods. And therefore you don't address your God as the Heavenly Father because that means you don't believe that there are other Heavenly Fathers. There are other gods out there. So they will uh, discipline themselves and just say God, Heavenly Father. Uh, they all subtract from the person of Jesus. So who's Jesus to Jehovah's Witness? He's Michael the Archangel. Now, if you ask them that, do you believe that, that Jesus is Michael the Archangel? They'll say yes. And say, show me that in the Bible, please. We have a passage. Well, you know, they claim to be great biblical experts, but of course there's no place in the Bible that says that. But he existed in that phase until he was born of Mary. And they do believe in a literal virgin birth, but they believe the person that she was pregnant with was not eternal God, the word. It was Michael, the archangel who became a man. And Jesus basically, as many of them say, was adopted at the baptism. Remember God said, this is my beloved son. What's he saying? He's now anointed to be my son and to do these miracles and pay the price for sin, so to speak, uh, on the torture stake, not, not the cross. So it's Jesus, yes, with all the words and the terminology, but with the content of the person totally altered. Same way with God, just like I was sharing with you. Mormons always say God, Heavenly Father because they believe in an infinite number of gods. They say that you can become a god if you become a good, temple-worthy Mormon. The famous saying by Mormons that was created by one of their presidents, Ezra Snow, that they still validate is that as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. We were in the uh, tabernacle, not the temple, in the tabernacle in Salt Lake City. And John Carmack, one of the authorities of the church, was explaining to a group I had there on tour their view of God. And basically what he said was fairly 
fairly revealing, not totally, but fairly. One of my colleagues raised his hand and said, I have a question for you. Would you call yourself a monotheist or a polytheist? He said, Chuck, you'll love this. He said, I'm both. You know, that's like a wife asking her husband, are you a monogamous or bigamous? Well, I'm, or polygamous? Well, I'm both. Uh, you know, that raises more questions than it answers, folks. And that's what he said. They Mormons say, well, we have one God that's our God, but there's an infinite number of gods out there. And if you become a good Mormon temple worthy, you can become a God too. God, Jesus are all radically redefined subtraction. Third thing that mathematicians, that, that the operation of mathematics involves is what? Addition, subtraction, multiplication. Three times three is, four times four is 8,692 times 10,497 is Okay, I, I, I surrender too. I, surrender. I just made that one up. Multiplication. What do they multiply? They multiply the way of salvation. No false prophetic movement ever, ever endorses sola so, uh, so fide, sola Christus, sola gratia. It's not faith alone, Christ alone, grace alone. Never, 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 never. Never. Because they want you to be in their group. They want to captivate you. They want to make you a slave to their theology that you have to stay in that group till death and through death, they think, in order to achieve salvation. And of course, the great joy of the Christian faith is Jesus paid it all on the cross. That he was made sin for us so we could be made the righteousness of God in him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that almost everyone who believes, no, whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Wow, what a great truth. Did you know that the Christian faith in the Bible is the only one that talks about salvation compared to all the other faiths as a gift? You won't find that. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is salvation. You won't find that in any other religion. I, I, I challenge you, please, if you find it out there where it says that explicitly in a primary document of any religious faith, come and tell me about it. Because every faith says you have to work for it. You have to gain it. Some faiths say you have to have reincarnation. You have to have multiple lifetimes to get to a level of purity and so forth. And then you get reabsorbed back into the great universal world soul, whatever that might do for you. But anyway, the point is, the point is, it's only the Christian faith that talks about salvation as a gift. The angel said to the shepherds, today is born for you in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. The one who came, came to save because he came to give himself so that salvation is a gift. But not so with false prophetic movements. The gospel is perverted, it's obscured, and therefore you have to join their group to get it. They will insist on that. You have to be a Jehovah's Witness to get to God's paradise on earth. You can't get into heaven anymore. That's full, 144,000 already taken care of. But you can't be in his earthly paradise. That, uh, that raises more questions than I can answer right now. But heaven's full, but you can get into God's earthly paradise. But you can only do that by being a good, faithful member of the Watchtower Society. Then, then you could qualify. Mormons, same way. Temple worthiness. Um, but here's the point, too. You can, you can take their discipleship manual called uh, Gospel Principles. Turn to the chapter on atonement. It has a story of a man who owes a great debt in that chapter. And he can't pay it. He's hauled in the court. They say, we're going to 
put you in prison and sell your family into slavery if you can't pay the debt. Somebody steps up and says, he can't pay it, but I'll pay it for him. And all God's people said, amen. Thus far, you haven't heard the whole story though. Does that evoke a memory of another story somewhere? How about in the gospel? Jesus told a story like that, didn't he? However, in the gospel principle story, the man said, I'll pay his debt. Oh, would you do that for me? Thank you very much. Yes, I'll pay your debt, but you must pay me back. It won't be easy, but it will be possible. Now that tells you everything about Mormon salvation. Jesus paid the down payment for your salvation, but you pay the monthly installments. And that means you have to do your best to be a consistent, temple-worthy Mormon in order to get into the celestial kingdom. And how do you do that? By becoming a faithful member of the church. And they'll list a bunch of things you got to keep doing. And that includes tithing, showing up at sacrament meetings, staying off coffee, nicotine, alcohol, all that stuff. And you do all those things and you might make it. However, if you ever, 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 ever uh, leave the Mormon church, you become an apostate and you go to hell. So you know what I say? I'll never join the Mormon church because if I never join, then I'll never run the danger of going to hell. And in the Mormon theology, the point is too, because they say only the apostates go to hell. Everybody else goes to a better place. Celestial kingdom, terrestrial kingdom, celestial kingdom. And you can get to the celestial kingdom anyway if you're baptized by proxy when you're dead. That's why they have these temples out there all over now, all over many places in Europe, all around the world, 155 or more of, or more of them. You go there, you get baptized by proxy. Someone will be baptized in your name. And during the millennium, everybody who ever existed in the Mormon thinking and theology will be baptized by proxy. Multiplication. And I say, why should I join the Mormon church? Because I'm going to get it all anyway. And if I don't join, I don't run the risk of going to hell. So I, Mormons hadn't been able to answer that for me. Last thing is the vision. They all claim to be the true church of Jesus Christ. None of them say we're an expression of the church. They all say we're the true church. A few minutes we have left. Let me just suggest a few things to you about evangelizing or sharing the faith with them. First of all, know the truth. Be well grounded. Get your people well grounded in the truth. When I was pastor of a church in Brussels, People said, Alan is in our Bible study group. He's always causing problems. Alan is a former, was a former Jehovah's Witness. I said, Alan, come and see me. I gave him a little book to read, Basic Christianity. I said, Alan, I want you to read the first two chapters of this book. Look up every Bible passage that it says and come and see me. Hey, he came back excited because nobody had taken the time to ground him in the faith. Let's all be sure we grow in our faith and our understanding of the truth and we encourage others to do the same. By the way, Alan went on to become a missionary and serve the Lord faithfully. Know the truth. Number two, understand that group's false doctrine and understand their use of vocabulary. Put a little time in on it. There are beautiful websites out there. Watchman Fellowship has tremendous materials. If you Google watchmanfellowship.com, they will lead you to a multitude of groups and show you other links that will help you. Learn what their basic doctrines are and learn how they use vocabulary to seem to be Christian and want to be Christian. Stick to the basics. Next thing I suggest. Now, not always stick to the basics. <laughs> what I mean by that. If they want to lead you in a different direction, you know, or if you feel the 
desire and the impulse of the spirit to go in a little different directions than just the basics do so. Uh, we were discussing with Mormon missionaries once about Joseph Smith, and one of my students said to the missionary, said, hey, wasn't Smith a polygamist? And one of the two missionaries of the church, Latter-day Saints, one of them said, no, he wasn't. And I said, well, Todd Compton just wrote a book in Sacred Loneliness, The Lives of 38 of the Known Wives of Joseph Smith. And the other one grabbed his arm and says, yes, he was. Are there other questions, please? But what that did, and I don't know the history, it raised the question in that missionary's mind. Have I been told the truth about Joseph Smith? And is the church telling me the truth that I need to know about these doctrines and all that I need to know? About? So I'm not saying don't ever go to secondary issues, but generally the way to speak to people is the, the basic truths and the, the central truths of the faith. Number five, uh, or next, I should say, I think that's number four. Focus on the nature of Jesus and salvation. Salvation by grace through faith. We've already talked about that for a few moments. Salvation by grace through faith. No, there's, there's no other gospel. There's no other gospel that will have anything good to say to the thief on the cross. Hey, buddy, you missed your chance. Maybe you'll get an opportunity in the next life. Maybe you can come back in another life. Uh, maybe things won't be so bad after all. But Jesus could look at that thief on the cross and say, today you will be with me in paradise. No other religion can tell him that. Because... We've got the gospel. That's the life-changing essence of the truth of faith and uh, trust in the person of Jesus Christ. Because what Jesus Christ did on that cross, we can be saved and know eternal life. Share scriptural basics. Now, Mormons carry around that Book of Mormon. Jehovah's Witnesses carry around their New World Translation. You might just say to Jehovah's Witness, hey, you know, there's 180, if, if they're operating in English, there's 180 versions, at least, of the, of the Bible in the English language, but yours is the only one that says, and Jesus was a God. Why is that? I did this once with a couple of Jehovah's Witness missionaries. How come, of all the translations in the world, Jehovah's Witnesses are the only one to put A in there, in the English translation? Well, the learner, there's always a trainer and a learner. The learner said, well, I don't know. I said, well, you need to check that out. I said before, I believe that translation of that Bible in your hand there, I would check that out in several other versions because Catholic, Orthodox, all the Protestants, all the ecumenical translations, none of them have a God. How come your version does? You need to ask that kind of a question of your translation. And the trainer said, you know, we've got another point where we've got to get to it. <laughs> We're going to have to leave right now. But most of them have never read the Bible. The Mormons read about the Bible. They read what their church tells them the Bible says. Get them reading the Bible. Hey, read through the Gospel of John. Challenge them a chapter a day. Pray a simple prayer. God, show me who Jesus is. Show me what salvation is all about. And if we believe that God is real, is personal, the Holy Spirit is real, is personal, He can speak to their hearts. He can help them in that understanding of, the, of their faith and show them those basic verses. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Romans 10, 9 through 13, John 3, 16, Romans 6, 23, the basic verses on, on salvation. They don't have to read the whole Bible, but show them that the Bible has a definite, different message about salvation and about the gospel. Lastly, share your testimony. Share how Jesus became real to you. Most of them don't have, they have a testimony about joining a group. Oh, you know, they, they were so kind to me. They were so helpful to me. They did this for me. Well, where's Jesus in that, you know? Share your testimony, how you came to know Jesus Christ personally. 
as your Lord and Savior and what he did to change your life and how you walk with him, you know him personally, you pray, you have that intimate fellowship and relationship with him because none of them have it. Believe me, none of them have it. And in that testimony, share how you know when you die, you're going to be with the Lord in heaven. Uh, a doctoral study was done on Islam, uh, people who converted from Islam to Christianity. The most appealing thing about the Christian doctrine was the assurance of salvation. Because no Muslim has assurance of salvation. No Mormon has real assurance that they'll get to the celestial kingdom. No Jehovah's Witness has that assurance. They have to stay faithful and stay engaged to the end or they're going to miss it and lose it all. It's only the real biblical gospel that gives the assurance and the truth of salvation. Show them and tell them how that's real to you and how it changes your life and the way you live.